welcome to Shakespeare with Sarah, where I break down Shakespeare for actors. Today I am looking at Rosalind's kind of monologue, He Wants to Imagine Me His Love. I've made a couple of other Rosalind and Phoebe videos, so I highly recommend you check out the description below for some links that might help you, particularly my video on Rosalind's and why I pray you monologue, where I talk a lot about Rosalind's character. In this video today, I'm going to talk about the context for this monologue and also break down all the meanings. So let's jump into the context for this monologue. Rosalind is in the forest of Arden. She is dressed up as a boy and she spots the guy that she fell in love with, who has been writing poems about her and sticking them on trees. And she bumps into him and is like, oh, I'm just gonna like go and rib him. And her poor cousin is like, don't, you idiot. Rosalind is a bit crazy when it comes to these things when she's dressed as Ganymede, as I talked about in the other video, because as soon as she is kind of disguised, it's like the floodgates open and suddenly she's like, I'm just going to be crazy. I'm going to tell everybody everything that I think. And I'm going to go and talk to that guy that I like that I couldn't even talk to before. So she goes to talk to Orlando and she's like, oh, I, I don't really believe that you're in love. And he's like, yeah, I am. I'm totally in love. I think Orlando was very much one of those typical kind of Shakespeare lovers before they really truly experience love, where they kind of wander around and they're like, I am in love. I am in love. Romeo is a bit like that before he meets Juliet. And then he kind of experiences what real love is. And so, yeah, I think Rosalind's kind of on the money here. She doesn't really believe that Orlando is truly in love with her. She wants to kind of test it. She wants to test him. And so she says to him, well, actually, I'm gonna cure you of your lovesick state. And he's like, I don't wanna be cured. And she's like, yeah, yeah, you do. Like, you can just come to my house and I've cured someone like this before. And he's like, oh, did you? And then she starts talking about her experience curing a lovesick person that she is making up on the spot. Now, what is her objective in wanting Orlando to come and visit her so she can cure him of love? Surely she doesn't want him to be cured. Firstly, she wants to test whether he's really in love. And she thinks by being kind of like womanish, by being changeable in her emotions, kind of subjecting him, I think, to the worst of, how, not femininity, because it's not really a feminine thing specifically, just more like the worst of a person being up and down and feeling different things, being angry one moment and then switching and being loving the next. She thinks if she can kind of test him and see if he can weather that, then maybe he is truly in love with her and will also be able to deal with her at her worst. Feels like one of those memes that's like, if you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. So it's all her insecurity at play and she just wants him to play along and see what happens with the hope of a happy ending. Now we know that there is a happy ending at the end, but she does not know that right now. She is still in her kind of insecure state. So that's a lot going on for you as an actor is layering those levels of insecurity plus freedom of being disguised plus uh, wanting everything to work out happily ever after, but also not believing that it will. Right, so she starts off with, technically, yes, one, and in this manner. Now, this is a response to Orlando saying, did you ever cure any so? And that's from them talking about, oh, I cured this boy that was in love and la la la, and by doing this. So basically she's like, this is how I did it. Now, if you're doing it for an audition, you really don't need to keep that first sentence. It really doesn't matter. You can certainly jump in with, he was to imagine me his love. As we're digging into this, so this is her describing what she did to cure this imaginary person of their love. It's interesting because it's not real, you still need to do the kind of prep as if it were a real thing that she did. Otherwise, it's gonna become very wishy-washy. This is what I call a storytelling monologue where someone is basically going, I did this thing and they're describing it. It's hard to kind of sell it to an audience without doing a fair bit of prep for yourself. So it becomes kind of real and connected. Otherwise, it becomes this sort of wash of emotion and description and an audience is just gonna be like, Eh, why do I care about this? So here are a couple of things I recommend you do before you start and as you go through your monologue prep. The first one is think about your island. 
You want to think about when are you speaking to Orlando, when you may be talking to Celia if you choose to, and when are you thinking. You've got to think about a spot to look at when you're in your thinking mode as Rosalind, because otherwise our habit as actors and humans is to look down at the floor, which doesn't connect with an audience, right? In terms of using strategic eyeline, you want to look at Orlando when whatever you are saying is really targeted at him, when you want him to react in a certain way. So throughout this monologue, I would be thinking about how do I want Orlando to react? What sort of reactions am I watching for? And when am I really kind of directing a line at him so I can watch for that reaction? Or when am I maybe, you know, just generally saying it, but I'm sneakily looking for a reaction or when am I just thinking back over things and that's going to be more an upward eyeline just to reflect to myself, but keep myself open to the audience. Actually, what she's doing is actually planning. She's like, I'm going to do this to Orlando. And it, as she's speaking, she's like, yeah, this is what will work. So she's saying to Orlando, well, I told this guy that he had to imagine that I was the person that he loved and I told him he had to come to see me every day so he could kind of romance me. And because when I did this, I was a very young and changeable boy, which I am totally still now, I would just subject this guy to all these different emotions. This is basically what she's saying at the beginning of this monologue. So at which time would I, being but a moonish youth, grieve? Be effeminate, changeable, longing and liking, proud, fantastical. Now, all of those before are pretty much, you know, what they sound like. Fantastical is kind of like high energy and maybe a bit crazy and spinning amazing, amazing stories of things. Apish can be like sort of silly, shallow is what it sounds like. Inconstant, so again, like changeable, like, and that can also, inconstant can be like, um, also referring to like faithfulness in love. So she would pretend like, I love you and no, I don't love you. Full of tears, full of smiles, for every passion something and for no passion truly anything. Now for that one, that's an interesting one. I take this as when the guy, the imagined guy was being passionate about something to her, she would have some sort of crazy reaction. And then when he wasn't, she would also have <laughs> any sort of crazy reaction. As boys and women are, for the most part, cattle of this color. So that's a play on horse of this color. So instead of saying horse of this color, so she's basically saying like, oh, most women and boys are like this. Like as she described, they're changeable. They have too many emotions. They react in any which way. Would now like him, now loathe him, then entertain him, then forswear him. Now this is all I think fairly straightforward. She's painting a picture of how she would react one way and then change the other way. And for swear kind of like being like swear him off and be like, I'm not having anything to do with you. Now weep for him, then spit at him, then I drave my suitor from his mad humor of love to a living humor of madness. So notice all the word play. She's so, so clever. So she's often kind of setting things up in metaphors or comparisons or twisting common turns of phrase and that's all part of her character and I think part of how she kind of convinces Orlando to come and do this thing with her even though it sounds crazy. <laughs> so drave just means drove but they use it it's just different kind of grammar that they used to use then from his mad humor of love. Now humor is not like funny it's kind of like um emotion like they that's they kind of called the humors was like when you're in a particular kind of emotion. So he was in like a mad state of love to a state of living madness is kind of how I would uh, translate that one, which was to forswear the full stream of the world and to live in a nook merely monastic. She cured this guy so well that he didn't really want to live in the world anymore, but actually went and lived in a monastery which is a very interesting end to her description. Like, it feels like a bit of a stretch, Rosalind, but for some reason, you know, Orlando is kind of like, oh, well, maybe this would work for me. I think what's really interesting there is all the relationship stuff going on underneath. Orlando is somehow being won over by her, even though she's dressed as a boy and she's promising to be horrible to him. Something about that 
entices Orlando. So you have to think for yourself, like, what is it that's winning over Orlando here? Something that she's doing, is it just her freedom or her craziness that she can't usually be, that she's not usually very good expressing herself, but here everything's flowing and she's vibrant in a really odd way. And he's, she's sort of entertaining, I think, as well. I think, she, I think Orlando is very curious. So I think, do think about underneath all this, everything that she's saying, is there a vitality there maybe that's really enticing to Orlando? And thus I cured him. And this way will I take upon me to wash your liver as clean as a sound sheep's heart. Now they thought that love lived in the liver. <laughs> so, you know, which is fair enough. I mean, why does it live in the heart for us now? I don't know, liver seems just as reasonable. So she's basically saying, I'm gonna wash all the love out of you so you'll be as clean <laughs> as a healthy sheep, that there shall not be one spot of love in it. And you can actually say int. And Orlando does respond with, I would not be cured, youth. And then she just says a couple more lines like, I would cure you if you would, but call me Rosalind and come every day to my cot and woo me. And then he's like, okay, he changes his mind. So it's so important, I think, in this to think about the layers there, what's going on. This is a relationship-driven monologue. So underneath everything has to be understanding how you want him to react and imagining how he is reacting. So if you can grab someone to practice with and tell them, okay, I want you to resist me or whatever. So you have obstacles to get around because she does, I think, have to kind of win him over. I think that Orlando is not really sold on this kind of crazy youth to begin with, but as she keeps talking, he's a bit more like, mm, okay, I kind of get it and I can, I can see where you're going with this. So this is a very hard monologue to do on your own. So I would highly recommend having a practice with someone, even if it's on Zoom or whatever, just to see the impact that you have on someone else when you're saying these things. And I hope that's helpful. Good luck with all your auditions and let me know if you have requests. Like, share, subscribe and comment below with all your thoughts. And I wish you the best of luck and I will see you next time.